respiratory emergencies. And this is not only the advanced EMT, but also the EMT um, uh, lecture for tonight. So as I was saying earlier, if you see some information that you just don't, like it's not in your book, EMTs, um, I don't want you necessarily to 100% disregard it. Definitely soak up the information, but know that you're not going to be tested on this. And also know that um, some of the things that we're going to go over are not going to be in your scope of practice. Uh, however, definitely listen to um, uh, some of the information that you're going to get that may be a little bit above what's in your book on the fundamentals of understanding your pathophysiology, because that's going to get you a long way. So um, our national competencies, we're going to talk about medication, we're going to talk about the difference between the upper and lower lower airways, and we're going to go over all the AMP involved with, oh, let me get back, um, AMP and patho dealing with all of these different kinds of um, illnesses, epilotitis, spontaneous pneumo, pulmonary edema, asthma, and you guys can read the list. We're going to go over each one of them, okay? Okay, so let's talk about what is dyspnea. Um, let me make sure my chat is open so I can see if you guys have any problems. Okay, so dyspnea is literally just difficulty breathing. Sounds pretty simple, right? Um, you're going to find this in a lot of your calls when you go out as uh, a provider and your symptoms are going to vary. It could be simply from like hay fever, um, just a small cough, maybe a cold, all the way to, you know, complete heart failure. Uh, the person is um, at the point where they're not breathing well at all, or maybe even not breathing. Uh, so when you go to these calls, think about all the different medical problems that this patient can potentially have, and then make sure that you really do a well, a really well job on your sample history. And whenever you're performing that assessment, make sure you listen to breath sounds, make sure that you're keeping all of that uh, to the forefront. Okay, so one thing that we need to do is understand that when a patient has dyspnea, when they're having trouble breathing, um, it says can be terrifying to a patient. If you think back to any time in your life, because there's been a time in your life where you've coughed so hard that you've lost the ability to, to breathe, okay? Think about that, but think about it 10 times worse. Or think about a time when um, you were so sick or knew somebody that was so sick that they were in the hospital because of a respiratory problem. And think of that fear, you know, put yourself in their shoes, so to speak, so that you can help them with their anxiety moving forward. So let's go over our AMP portion. Um, we have the respiratory system consists of all these structures that help contribute to breathing. And we've discussed prior to about um, gas exchange uh, in the alveoli and how the process goes with the deoxygenated blood um, to oxygenated blood through the pulmonary system. But we're going to go over it one more time because you can never go over it enough. As a matter of fact, uh, repetition is the key to learning. So as this, um, we all understand that the airway is just a tube to get oxygen that's in the atmosphere into our lungs and then for respirations to take place and then ven ventilations take place and respira respirations take place. So when we are supplied with a oxygen rich atmosphere during inhalation, that's going to go through the pulmonary circulation and it's going to go into uh, around the capillary beds around the alveoli and it's going to switch over. And what switches over is oxygen goes into the body and carbon dioxide and other waste materials come up through the lungs and then we exhale. So that's the the long and the short of it. And there's a really pretty picture. And you guys can read all about how deoxygenated blood's coming in. Then it's going to go over. There's going to be the gas exchange in the alveoli. Or excuse me, uh, oxygenated blood comes over. Um, see, this goes opposite from the way I teach it, but that's okay. Um, but deoxygenated blood is going to go back up. Um, more, not just like, excuse me, let me stop. I'm running all over my my words here. So as as we breathe in, we're getting oxygen into our lungs. So the deoxygenated blood comes through and it grabs that oxygen, giving off the carbon dioxide. Then it goes through the body, off gases the oxygen, and that's internal respiration, and then it comes back, okay? I think I said that right. If I didn't, I apologize. Um, here is the left um, 
the figure right here, this big one, is the pulmonary circulation. And as you can see, this shows how everything goes through the heart to the lungs. And you can literally, it's just like one of those uh, Shoney, <laughs> I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to a Shoney's or something like that when you were a kid and you looked on the back and even on the back of cereal boxes and you're tracing and everything else. You can start anywhere you want in here and see how this traces through the heart, through the lungs and everything else. And you can see how much uh, oxygenation and deoxygenation happen, how much um, when all of this passes over. And it's in several different places. So when we breathe in, we get oxygen into our system and it goes over the alveoli. And we'll talk about carbon dioxide in just a second. That oxygenated blood is going to go to the remainder of all the organs in the body. It doesn't matter where it is. It could be your feet. It could be your brain. It could be anywhere, right? And it has another additional step where it crosses over again. And now oxygen goes to our organs, our skin, our uh, all of these different places in our body. And that pulls in um, all the nasty, which is going to be mostly your carbon dioxide, goes back into through the heart, into the lungs, and then it's off gassed as carbon dioxide. So um, ventilation is the process of just moving the air in and out. Remember that's um, we ventilate when we are uh, when we have somebody that we're bagging, um, and bagging means we take a bag valve mask and we are breathing for that patient. We are ventilating for that patient, if you will. Um, so the heart pumps oxygenated blood throughout the body at this point and carbon dioxide is exchanged for oxygen, which I think I've said a couple of different times. Um, one thing that does happen is as it diffuses, the carbon dioxide does diffuse back into the alveoli. It goes back up through the bronchial tree and it moves out through the upper airways during your, ex your exhalation. So the difference is now is that carbon dioxide is just exchanged for oxygen, if you will, and just goes in opposing directions. And here's a better picture of kind of how to show um, the capillary uh, blood that's, that moves towards and around all the alveoli and how oxygen literally passes over through the capillaries and those tissues. Uh, and then also how car carbon dioxide does the same thing just in reverse. So inspiration, um, the stimulus to breathe comes from the respiratory center in the medulla, okay? And this is the strangest thing. So you actually have, it's involuntary, but you can also take a deep breath when necessary. So the stimulus to breathe comes from the medulla. That one is absolutely involuntary, but can we make ourselves breathe in. Absolutely. And that's controlled by the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. And those contract. And when they contract, they contract down. And if you will, if, so if you take like the, the diaphragm is kind of like this. And when it contracts, it comes down. It contracts. Got it? So when it comes down, it's taking these lungs and moving the lungs down, causing Bi uh, a bigger air space inside. So the normal inspiratory reserve volume is about 300 mLs in males and 2300 in females. Uh, and this is important for you to know because we're going to talk about dead air space. So expiration, as the chest does expand, we have mechanical receptors. And these are inside of our chest wall and our bronchioles, and it sends a signal to our apneustic center in the brain. And this is going to inhibit the inspiratory center saying, hey, okay, we're done. We've had enough, and now expiration occurs. So it just terminates, if you will, inhalation to prevent overexpansion of the lungs because we don't want that to, call, to happen. And this is called, a, this is a feedback loop that we call the herring brewer reflex. And that's, that's important for you to recall later on. Um, and why do we not want to overexpand our lungs? Well, we don't want to pop a lung, do we? That's exactly what would happen if our apneustic centers were not working correctly. So um, one of the things about this is your normal expiratory reserve volume is around 1,200, and there's a discrepancy there naturally. So um, one thing about expiration is it's going to last twice as long as inspiration. And you can do this at home. You can take a deep breath and then blow it out. 
and you can count or you can just listen to me do it and you can realize that that is 100 percent true so think about when we have somebody that's to kipnik remember ta uh, tacky means fast so we know that 12 to 20 is the number for adults that's our normal number so if it's above 20 breaths per minute that's considered to kipnia so we understand because we know that expiration lasts twice as long as inspiration that it's shorter in patients with tachypnea and so they're not getting out all that carbon dioxide either and it says here in my notes to go ahead and check out table uh tables 17-1 and 17-2 for a list of characteristics of adequate and inadequate respirations or uh, breathing rather so let's talk about perfusion um, that's got to occur for our body parts to receive nutrients and oxygen. If that perfusion does not happen, then you are going to see signs and symptoms of that. And some of those can be bluing, like cyanosis of the skin. It can be pale, ashy skin. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other um, signs and symptoms that you may see. So multiple different complications can absolutely interfere with our oxygen intake and here are a few of them uh, so we have our upper and lower airway obstructions and of course our upper airway obstructions can be like a fbao which is a foreign body airway or obstructed um airway obstruction we can have some sort of some form of trauma remember um last week we were talking about um actually no that wasn't last week um but if you have somebody hit in their um just right here in their neck uh with a ball we'll say it's a baseball that's going to eventually swell that's going to cut off your airway that's not good um inflammation you can have like epiglottitis tonsillitis that's another one lower airway obstruction also can be caused by trauma okay so you can have another uh baseball hit your chest and the same thing happen you can have like COPD or even CHF. You can have pneumonia, which is like just a mucus accumulation in one area. You can have smooth muscle spasms. You can have edema. There can be a chest wall impairment. So once again, let's go back to our trauma. Um, we can have a hemothorax, which is um, where you have blood in the lungs instead of air. You can have a pneumothorax where you have um, the lung is literally popped and, and there's the air is going into the mediastinum and it's not going into the lung itself. It's moving out of the lung. Um, you'd have pleural effusion. You could have pleural inflammation. And then you can have neurological control problems and like MS or um, multi, uh, muscular dystrophy. Um, and those can cause be caused by brainstem malfunctions, stroke, uh, also trauma. <laughs> trauma is a big deal. Um, and then you can have neuromuscular disease issues. So one thing that we have to do is when we see these, we have to rapidly analyze and and give a great patient assessment whenever we're dealing with these patients. And when we see that they're having trouble breathing, we need to step in immediately. And this is the part where you need to be aggressive with your uh, with how you handle this patient, because if you're not aggressive, um, you your patient can die. So we want to make sure that we oxygenate and ventilate um as necessary depending on what's wrong with them right okay um and in the notes it says like table 17-3 is going to list some key signs and symptoms to help you recognize and differentiate between different respiratory complaints so let's talk about gas exchange interface so what is that okay let's talk about the alveoli let's really talk about down to the cellular level like what's really going on so our al alveoli are made up of two different types of, ce of cells. Uh, type one is allowed for better gas exchange. Type two makes new type one cells and produces surfactant. Now we remember, <clears throat> sorry, uh, remember that surfactant is going to help with surface tension. And if you do not have surfactant in the lungs, in the alveoli specifically, then the alveoli will close whenever all of the air is gone. So the surfactant actually helps keep the alveoli slightly open so that they can still get air inside of them. 
Um, so uh, this is why they say the alveoli function best when partially inflated. And so that's another thing. You're going to have that reserve air still inside of the, the alveoli as you go. Um, by reducing the surface tension of the alveoli, surfactant makes it easier for them to expand. So after foreign material gets into the terminal bronchioles and alveoli, it typically doesn't come back out. So you may have um, collapsed fluid filled or even pus filled alveoli. They're not going to do anything. They're just sitting there. So they're not going to be part of the gas exchange. So if you have a patient that says, well, yeah, I have pneumonia. That whole area, wherever that consolidation is, there's no gas exchange taking place. That's why your patient has such trouble breathing. Um, okay, so conditions related to ventilation and or perfusion can prevent oxygen from reaching the bloodstream. Um, pulmonary capillaries are narrowed and normally allow red blood cells to pass through only in single file. And that's important because we don't want a huge backup, right? We don't need a whole bunch at one time that are getting past this one area and they're not having the gas exchange take place. So we're going to keep it very thin, very, very organized, one at a time. Okay, you you get some oxygen, you get some oxygen, you get some oxygen, give me your carbon dioxide, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, and core pulmonale is going to be our right side of heart failure caused by chronic lung disease. And that's not good because if you have right side of heart failure, your gas exchange is not going to work. It's not going to be as well. We're going to get further into that in a little bit, though. So we're going to put a pin in that one for just a minute because I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Now, carbon dioxide retention and hypoxic drive. Now, I don't care if you're an advanced ENT. I don't care if you're an EMT. This is important for you to know because after today, you're going to be tested on this everywhere you go. You're going to hear hypoxic drive over and over and over again. So please take special note of, of this area in your book. So the level of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood can rise for many, many reasons. There are various types of lung disease that may impair your exhalation process. So if we take for just two seconds, if we have a disease that stops us from exhaling, and we know that when we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide, right? So now we're re retaining carbon dioxide. I just want to keep everybody on that same, same page. The body may actually produce too much CO2 temporarily and even chronically, depending on what your disease is, okay? If arterial carbon dioxide levels rise slowly to an abnormally high level and remain there, the respiratory center of the brain doesn't work as efficiently. As a matter of fact, it kind of says, wait a minute, I don't know what's going on here. Hmm. So the centers are not going to respond uh, normally to this rise in the arterial level of CO2. And as a result, chronic carbon dioxide retention happens. Now, enter hypoxic drive. This is a backup system used to control breathing based on low, uh, low levels of oxygen rather than high levels of carbon dioxide. Now, this is a gradual accommodation of higher levels of CO2, and then it uses this backup system to kind of control that breathing. And once again, it's not based on carbon dioxide levels. It's based on oxygen levels. Write that down. Highlight it. It's based on oxygen levels, low levels of oxygen. So, now, the stimulus to breathe is the detection of low blood oxygen levels. So I know that um, my EMTs, we haven't gotten really far into this, but COPD is one of those people that they may have like a, a SpO2 of 88 and they're like, yeah, that's my normal. And you're like, how? It's because it's their normal. So keep this in mind. If the arterial level of oxygen is raised, there's less stimulus to breathe. So we're not going to oversaturate our COPD patients or patients that have this issue, period, by giving them too much oxygen. Because what will happen is the brain isn't working correctly. It's saying, wait a minute, oh, no, 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 we have way too much oxygen. We're going to breathe four times a minute now. 
that's not okay. Pump your brakes. We're not doing that. That's killing someone, right? So we have to watch what's going on. And we have to understand our disease process to understand that these people have a very high CO2 level and the brain doesn't get that. And it says, hey, you know what? You know what? We're going to we're gonna figure this out. We're just going to go on low oxygen levels. And the lower the oxygen level is, the better off we are. We're going to keep breathing because we want to get those oxygen levels up. So the one thing that I do want you to keep in mind when we're going through this entire thing is never withhold oxygen from a patient who needs it. If they are struggling to breathe, if they are, if they are saying, I can't breathe, or um, they're in a tripod position, one to two word dyspnea, whatever it is, just because you know this in your head doesn't mean you're like, yeah, I don't think they need oxygen because I don't want them to die because I'm giving them too much. Absolutely not give them the oxygen that they require uh, because we're talking, um, you're not gonna kill somebody in 10 minutes by giving them excess oxygen. You're just not, okay? Now, hypoventilation. When, um, so when the lungs fail to work properly, the body can't dispose of carbon dioxide efficiently. And so it just accumulates in the blood, okay? And this, it can cause respiratory acidosis. So those of you who don't know, carbon dioxide is considered an acid in our system. EMTs, this is something new to you, but I do want you to understand this. Um, as we breathe out acid um, with the carbon dioxide, we're balancing our blood, okay? So that's how this, this works in our system. So um, as it accumulates in our blood, Excess carbon dioxide combines with water to form bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions, also known as carbonic acid, and that's how we're going to get our respiratory acidosis. So acidosis can occur if hypoventilation is not recognized. Why? Because we're not getting that excess carbon dioxide out. We're just holding on to it, and it's staying inside of our bodies. So if you think about it, Impaired ventilation can be contributed to so many different things, okay, COPD, CHF, it could be trauma, it can be um, atelectasis, it can be pneumonia. There are, there are so many different things out there that can cause impaired ventilation. Um, and so, and, and we're talking about upper and lower um, airway obstructions here, right? So if we have impaired ventilation, then that means that we can't get that carbon dioxide out, okay? So that level in our blood is also directly related to our pH. So hypoventilating patients have uh, that respiratory acidosis. I'm going to keep saying that because you guys need to know it. Once again, repetition is the key to learning, right? All right. Okay. As the carbon dioxide level does increase, their pH level decreases. So now that sounds like a little, wait a minute, what? <laughs> But yes, the more acidic a person is, the lower their pH balance is. So there are many types of problems um, that could cause patients to hypoventilate. So there's our lung function issue, uh, mechanism or mechanics of breathing, and the reduce in uh, respiratory drive. You can also have like a um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. You can have botulism. There's so many different types of uh, conditions that you can have. Uh, uh, spinal cord injuries, I'm looking over here at these notes. Uh, um, yeah, botulism. I'm gonna have to have a whole side note on botulism on how that works. Um, but for right now, we're just gonna move on. Um, okay, so hyperventilation. That's over breathing to the point that the arterial carbon dioxide falls below normal. And this may be an indicator of life-threatening illness. So this is the body's attempt to compensate for the acidosis. It's trying to get this buildup of excess acid um, that's in this body. And it's saying, hey, 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 what's going on here? Um, the lowering of this carbon dioxide helps to compensate for other acids and tachypnea without physio physiological demand for increased oxygen causes the respiratory alkalosis. So if you are breathing so fast that you don't have enough carbon dioxide in your system, the body is gonna go into an alkalinic 
state. And that's going to cause several symptoms from this hyperventilation syndrome. And some of them, guys, you can see, mostly you'll see these as panic attacks. But you think about your anxiety, dizziness, there's numbness, there's tingling in the hands and feet, and this can cause the uh, carpopedal spasms. And I don't know if you've ever seen a patient before or, or known someone that's had such a terrible um, anxiety attack or hyperventilation that their, their fingers literally crawl up like this, and it's because they can't straighten them out, and their toes do the same thing. It's very odd when you see it. Um, and then you have... Um, the can be the body's um, response to illness, buildup of acids, um, and this can occur in the absence of other physical problems. And so you're going to see this a lot during psychological stress. Okay. Now, let's do causes of dyspnea. And by the way, are there any questions so far? If there are, please feel free to drop them in the chat for me. Sorry, guys, I need a little sip of something. Okay. Um, causes of dyspnea. Well, there's a ton of those, right? Um, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, you can call it whichever one you want. But you're going to need to learn the word dyspnea because that's a big deal. Um, one or more of the situations most likely does exist. Atelectasis. You can have damaged alveoli, obstructed airway passages, and that can be from blood clots. I mean, it can be from mucus. Um, it could be air or fluid filled, uh, pleural spacing and lining. Uh, it can be rib fracture, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, seizures, hyperventilation syndrome, uh, you name it. Uh, drug overdoses, carbon monoxide poisoning. So as you treat these patients, and you figure out what's going on is the best way to continue to treat them. So like um, if we have obstructed airway passages, such as blood clots, is there anything you can really do in the field? No, but we can oxygenate. We can ventilate if necessary. But if they have, um, if you know for a fact that they have a pneumothorax, um, then we call for uh, additional help to take care of that, especially my EMTs, right? Um, because we understand that if there's not, if there's no air inside of the lung, then there's no, oh goodness. Um, I don't know what that was. <laughs> that scared me. Um, we do understand that there's no gas exchange in the alveoli at that point because there's no, um, there's no air inside of the lung tissue. All right. So uh, a patient with dyspnea may also report air hunger and chest tightness. One of the first things you're going to see or you're going to hear is the patient may may or may not even say, hey, I'm not getting enough air, but you're going to see a little bit of anxiety that that's going to happen. That's going to come into play. Um, and they get very anxious. They may not uh, really understand what's going on, but they do understand that they're not getting what they need. And so that causes a bit of an anxiety to them. That will give them a little bit of chest tightness. Because if the heart is not getting what it needs, like right now, as you're sitting in your in your chair or wherever you are, um, you're probably not fully aware that your heart is beating. But let it not get enough air or let not let it get enough blood and you will know immediately that your heart is not OK because it's going to send um, a message saying, hey, hey, I don't know what's going on, but that's not cool. Um, so, uh, hold on just a second. Somebody is unmuted and it keeps popping back on me. So I'm going to mute everybody. All right. Let me get back to my chat box. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so if you have a patient that has a cardiopulmonary disease, they're going to have a lot of dyspnea. That's just commonplace with them because of the fact that, that the air coming in and going through the heart, um, it's going to be damaged in such a way um, that the person is going to have to breathe more to get more oxygen to the heart. Like I said before, if you, um, as you're sitting there, you're not really having an issue with your heart. 
most likely, I don't know everybody's story, but most likely you're not really aware that your heart is, is beating or doing anything else. But if it has problems, and especially if it's not getting oxygen, enough oxygen, it's going to uh, hurt and it's going to make you breathe more and harder even, okay? Um, a severe pain can cause a patient to experience rapid shallow breathing without the presence of pulmonary dysfunction. Um, so here's my question to you. Have you ever been hit in a... Um, in your chest or have you ever yeah let's just say you've been hurt in your chest somehow physically like a trauma you don't want to take a big deep breath right no so if you're in pain your patient is going to have that tachypnea and it's going to be that rapid and shallow breathing and there may not be a reason for it it may just be that they can't take deep breaths because the expansion of the chest wall is going to is going to hurt them okay all right, upper and lower airway infections. So infectious disease may affect all parts of the airway naturally, but infections may call, cause dyspnea by obstructing airway flow in larger airways. Um, so we're taking right here, we're gonna take croup and epiglottitis, and these are two that you're gonna see a lot in the field. Um, and it does say here, table 17-5 does show um, some more um, diseases that you may be interacted or you may see um, in the field as you move along. Um, and for some reason, it doesn't give me a really good breakdown. Let me make sure. It's been several months since I've gone over this one. Okay, there's not a good slide for it. Okay, so essentially, croup is going to be um, you have croup and epiglottitis that you're going to see a lot in children, okay? Um, and croup is going to just kind of restrict that airflow just a little bit, whereas epiglottitis makes the epiglottis larger, okay? And you'll hear of the croupy cough. It's like a seal-like bark cough. Whereas epiglottitis, you're going to see a lot more drooling and everything else because it is an airway obstruction. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, children with epiglottitis, those are the ones that we just kind of hands off. We give them oxygen because they need that to breathe. Because can you imagine if your epiglottis is so swollen that you're drooling, can, do you really feel like you can get a lot of air through that? No, you can't. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna oxygenate those children. And by the way, adults can get epiglottitis. Uh, I had um, I had a run in with one who was in their 30s, and that was very interesting because I didn't realize that adults could get epiglottitis because going through EMT school, paramedic school, nursing school, that's not something that we were ever taught. But yes, adults can even get epiglottitis, and it's very painful for them as well. Um, so these infections, whether it's croup or epiglottitis, it can cause an issue with our gas exchange because if you can't get enough air through the airway, through those areas that are, are being blocked by this infection, well, obviously gas exchange is not going to take place as well. Now let's talk about acute pulmonary edema. And then we're going to go on break for just a few minutes, okay? All right, so we have an accumulation of fluid in the lungs, okay? A normal alveoli does not look like that bottom part, okay? Um, it's not stretched out as much, but this causes a decrease in gas exchange. Well, obviously, if we have fluid in our alveoli, we can't get gases across that, can we? No, of course not. Uh, it's going to result in severe dyspnea. Well, yeah, because I can't get gas exchange across that alveoli. That that alveoli right there is completely gone. Like, I can't use it anymore. Um, so fluid collects in these alveoli and in the lung tissues itself. So if, especially if this is like a chronic problem, then we're going to have a reduction in contractile force of the myocardium because the myocardium is not going to be able to do anything. It's going to cause severe damage simply because of this, because the heart muscle is trying to catch up. It's trying to get as much oxygen as it can, so the heart's going to beat faster. The left side of the heart can't remove uh, blood from the lungs as fast as the right side delivers it. So in this case, for pulmonary edema, the fluid collects in the alveoli and the lung tissue, and the fluid separates the alveoli from the pulmonary capillary vessels. This is going to stop 
So when this happens, this is what happens. Okay, we're getting further and further apart. That's going to interfere with our exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This can happen super rapidly, and sometimes it can take a little while, but within minutes this can happen, okay? And especially after, after like an MI or something like that. Now, not all patients with pulmonary edema have heart disease. There are tons of other, other reasons that this can happen. So we're talking like uh, smoke, toxic chemical fumes, huffing, um, it, it going into a fire without using your uh, SCBA mask, the fireman would. Uh, it can be traumatic injuries of the chest can even do this. It can even be exposure to high altitudes. So there's a lot of different reasons that this can happen. Patients with pulmonary edema that is cardiogenic in origin may present with signs and symptoms of a cardiac emergency. So what does that look like? Um, that can have all of these over here, hypoxic episode, they can go into shock. Um, they can have uh, on top of it, if they're non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, they can tend to have a history of uh, chest trauma. They could have a, a recent acute inhalation of toxic gases, particles, uh, recently going into a high altitude area without um, uh, acclimatizing to that area. So like you go up, you wait a little bit, you go up again. Um, I've never been that high in the mountains where I've had to um, do that. Uh, but the same is inverse when we're talking about diving. So remember that for later on in environmental emergencies. Um, all patients with pulmonary edema may also have your dyspnea, your orthopnea, the fatigue, reduced exercise capacity, pulmonary crackles. So there's a lot of different things that they can see and that you can, you can have going on here. Okay, so we're going to take a real quick 10-minute break. I'm going to get my phone out. Um, and I'm going to put this on a 10 minute break. I'm going to turn my camera off. So when my camera comes back on, you guys know we're going to start pretty soon thereafter. All right, going to go ahead and start. We got quite a bit to go. So let's um, kick it into high gear, so to speak. And by high gear, I just mean um, I'm going to talk a little faster than what I have been. So uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a slow process that disrupts airway, um, disrupts the airways and the alveoli. So cigarette smoking is the most common cause, but you will see people that have had asbestos um, uh, poisoning in uh, in their history. Also, not just cigarette smoking, but older firemen that back in the day they didn't use SBAs and stuff like that. You're going to see COPD with those patients as well. So. It's COPD, it's just kind of an umbrella term that describes a few different lung diseases, including your emphysema and chronic bronchitis, um, and also asthma. So the obstruction is going to occur in the bronchioles itself, and also your cilia, which are those hair-like, little finger-like projections that help get all that nasty out of our lungs. Well, they're unable to remove our excess mucus, and that's going to create this huge buildup. And what does that do? Well, that that's where we get our chronic bronchitis from. So um, patients that have this chronic productive cough for at least three months per year for two year for two or more consecutive years are going to be diagnosed with COPD. Um, and so you'll see this more and more, um, but it is one that takes time. So pneumonia is another one that's under the COPD banner. Um, and a lot of people know what, what pneumonia is. It simply just develops when the passages are consistently obstructed. So COPD is it's multiple episodes and they just continue on and not necessarily like, oh, well, you had pneumonia this year and then you had pneumonia three years later. No, no, no. We're talking about getting pneumonia repeated episodes. OK, and um, then you have your emphysema which is the most common form of your COPD. And this is characterized by the destruction of the alveolar walls related to the destruction of pulmonary surfactant. Remember, we talked about surfactant. You got to have it so that the, that the alveoli stay open. So what happens is there's large holes that are left in the lungs that resemble an air pocket or kind of like a cavity, if you will. 
it's irreversible. There's nothing that we can do about it. So most of these patients with CAPD have this chronic bronchitis emphysema happening. They have a history of reoccurring lung problems. They're almost always going to be your long-term smokers. They're going to consistently produce sputum, especially when they're having this chronic cough, and they're going to have that difficulty expelling their air from their lungs. And they're going to experience a longer expiration phase with wheezing. So there's another one for you to jot down. Now, uh, they're going to complain of our shortness of breath. They're going to gradually get worse as they go over days and days. You're going to see the pursed lips. And so it's almost like um, the duck lips, but not quite. They're gonna... <sighs> okay. Um, that's going to um, help. It, it, and it really will. It adds just kind of a little bit more of a uh, help to push that resist, that little extra resistance out. So that's why they do it through pursed lips. They're going to complain of this tightness in the chest and they're constantly fatigued. I and mean, can you imagine if you're going through life and you're not really getting all the air that you should be, of course you're going to be fatigued. So that makes a lot of sense. Also, they're going to have a chest with a barrel-like appearance. And so it's going to be kind of shaped like that, like this gentleman here. And he's very famous. He's in every single book I've ever seen, ever period that has a COPD patient. It's always that dude. I hope you got a lot of money before he, you know, maybe he got better. I don't know. Um, okay, so this is what COPD looks like over time with the alveoli. And see how that trapped air from, and you can see at the very at the very beginning, the very first one, hey, that's normal. Oh, wait, now, now we're getting some infection. We're getting a little bit of mucus buildup. And it's not going anywhere because the cilia aren't working, right? So it's just going to sit there. And now we're going to get even more inflamed and more inflamed. Well, now we're totally obstructed. And remember, gas exchange is still taking place, sort of. So there may be carbon dioxide that's kind of off-gassing, so to speak, or going across that, that membrane, but there's no oxygen coming over. So instead of there being an exchange of gas, there's only one gas that's exchanging, and it's just air trapping, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what happens? This guy over here, completely useless. And now it's so dilated that it's never going to work again. Asthma, a little different. So this one's where you have the acute spasm of the bronchioles. And you can see right here, that's your normal bronchial um, associated with excess mucus production and bronchiolar muscle spasm. So what happens is you get this excess uh, mucus, so to speak. I don't want to say mucus plug, but mucus that's in this airway. And when this mucus gets to like a certain spot, it's just like, hey, I don't like this. I'm going to have a muscle spasm now. And what happens is it just kind of shuts down a little bit, causing <coughs> pardon me, the bronchioles to become so small that you're going to hear wheezing. And so that's why this is a common and serious disease. Um, and then you can even have status asthmaticus. It's a severe prolonged attack and that can't be resolved with conventional treatments. Uh, it is a dire medical emergency where you're gonna end up using um, epinephrine to help you with that one. Um, but wheezing can be heard on the exhalation of these patients and breathing does appear relatively normal normal um, during that wheezing part, but you can hear it. Now, when it gets to like status asthmaticus, that's a whole different story. That's not normal breathing at all. Okay. Um, now, this can result from allergic reaction. You can have exercise-induced asthma. And as crazy as it sounds, I don't know if I just missed it the first time I went through EMT school or the first time I went through paramedic school, but it wasn't until nursing school that I found out that exercise-induced asthma was a thing. So what does that mean? Have you ever heard of the kids? And you may be one, you may know someone like this. They can't go play sports because of their asthma. Why? Because they get so excited and that even emotional stress, physical stress of their body, and they can't do it because it will result in an asthma attack. So you have the exercise induced one, you have severe emotional um, stress, and then you have your upper airway infections naturally. 
so anaphylaxis. Now, this is a severe allergic reaction. This isn't just like, oh, I have some hives and some wheels. I'm a little itchy. No, this is where you are char it's characterized by the swelling of your airways. There's a dilation of the blood vessels all over the body. Your blood pressure is going to go get lower. And you're going to, it's going to be called kind of like uh, anaphylactic shock is what you're going to hear that called. Um, so this can cause respiratory distress severe enough to lead to a coma or even death if not not handled appropriately and you can have itching don't get me wrong i'm not saying that you won't um and it can even be kind of like asthma like almost when it begins um because of that wheezing you're going to hear that wheezing and in some cases you're going to hear strider remember the only difference between wheezing and strider is where the airway is starting to close so in the lower airway it's going to be wheezing in the upper right here especially in the throat area it's going to be strider um so most reactions do occur within 20 minutes or excuse me 30 minutes of exposure to an allergen so you may see someone who is still eating at a lunch buffet and um, they got peanuts or something, or they may be back at the office and they may, you may see a to-go plate and you're like, hey, do you, what are you allergic to? Oh, well, I'm allergic to peanuts. Where did you go? I went to the Asian restaurant. Um, Asian food is primarily made with a lot of peanuts. So that's one. You can just throw in something extra out there. Now, spontaneous pneumothorax, that's different from just a regular pneumo, okay? Now, this is accumulation of air in the plural space, and it may be partial, it may be complete, and obviously one is halfway, the other one is all the way, right? Uh, trauma, most common cause, but it can be associated with a medical condition, especially if it's somebody who's had lung disease for a long time. Now, it's referred to as a spontaneous pneumothorax when it just happens out of the blue. Uh, may occur in patients with, like I said, those chronic lung infections, young, uh, and they were born with weak areas of their lung, or they have emphysema, they have asthma, something like that. There's always some sort of something behind it. It's not just somebody walking around who has a normal lung function and everything else. These are people that have diseased lungs. So patients become acutely dyspneic and typically complain of plural pleuritic chest pain. So what does that mean? That means that they, they may be walking around and suddenly they, they cough and suddenly they're like, oh gosh, I can't breathe right. Oh, my, my chest hurts. Oh no, this is not okay. It's unilateral, which means it's on one side. So let's talk about who we find these in. It's usually tall, thin, healthy males are also at risk. Um, patients become acutely dyspneic and typically complain of that pleuritic chest pain, chest pain like I was talking about. This is going to be a sharp, stabbing pain. And once again, unilateral, one side. Uh, worse during breathing or with certain movements in the chest wall. And patients may present with subcutaneous emphysema. So you're like, wait a minute, what's subcutaneous emphysema? Okay, so usually when you have subcutaneous emphysema, it's going to feel like um, Rice Krispies, if you will, when they hit milk, okay? Um, you know that snap, crackle, pop? That's what that sounds like. And you can feel it as you walk their chest wall. Um, and it's and you can even hear it at the same time. And those are just air bubbles that are kind of trapped under the skin. And by listening to the chest with a stethoscope, um, you may be able to note those sounds. Or like I said, you may even be able to, to feel it, especially if it's from um, a wound of some sort. Okay, um, so what are some of the findings that you're gonna that you're gonna find? You're gonna have a pale diaphoretic tachypneic patient. Some of your severe severe findings are gonna include the AMS. You're gonna have cyanosis and tachycardia. Uh, once again, we've already talked about unilateral decreased breath sounds. You're gonna have local hyperresonance to percussion. You're gonna have sub-Q emphysema and even tracheal deviation, which is a really late sign. And usually you won't actually see that until they're either dead or almost dead. Um, patients with symptoms indicating a severe episode require immediate immediate care. So um, advanced EMTs and EMTs alike, you call for that backup and you get somebody en route to help you with these. Okay, so pleural effusion, this is another one. Pleural effusion is just fluid around the outside of the lung 
and it can be on one or it can be on both sides. Now, think about it. You guys can look at this picture right here and see that the fluid is making that lung kind of move up into the chest. So if my lung is moving up and it's kind of condensing, then that means I'm going to have less area, surface area, to have respiration in, right? Usually I have it this big, now it's this big. Not no bueno, right? We can't we can't have respirations there, right? So your fluid may be from irritation, infection, it could be cancer, it could be a gradual buildup. Um, but usually when it happens, patients get a sudden onset of dyspnea and they get really upset really fast. So you're going to see anxiety, you're going to see air hunger, you're going to see people with severe shortness of breath. Um, and you may even see this with um Think about patients with lung cancer. They have this a lot, and this is because of their shortness of breath also. So when you listen with a stethoscope in the chest, um, you're going to make, you're going to see, or not see, sorry, you are going to hear the decreased breath sounds over that region of the chest where the fluid has moved the lung away from that chest wall. So it may even be decreased or even absent breath sounds. Um, Hold on just a second, y'all. One second. I have a eight-year-old. Hold on. I am so sorry about that, you guys. I have an eight-year-old who's home, and she's apparently running fever. So um, <clears throat> let's get to this. <laughs> um, okay, so when you listen um, with a pleural effusion, like I said, you're gonna see, you're gonna hear either decreased or absent lung uh, lung sounds from that area, of the chest wall. Um, patients usually feel better when they sit upright, and that makes a lot more sense because if you're laying down and you have fluid in the in in the plural space, that fluid is going to go back up under this lung and it's going to cause even less of an area where they can breathe in and get um, more air exchange, okay? So definitely make sure they're sitting straight up where, when they go. Um, and then obviously the definitive treatment is fluid removal. We can't do that. That has to be done in a hospital by a physician. Pulmonary embolism. Let me tell you how long, how far medicine has come in years and years and years. Uh, when I first started um, back in 2004, three, 2003 was the first time I took CPR, and they said if someone is blue from the nipple line up, meaning they've had a pulmonary embolism, which, by the way, if you don't know what a pulmonary embolism is, it is a blood clot. It stops the circulation of the venous system and it stops the travel from from that to the pulmonary artery. Literally, it can decrease or completely block that blood flow. When you see the, the complete block, the patient's going to be blue literally from the nipple line up. It's very definitive. It's very eerie. It's very strange. And when I was first taught CPR back in 2003, we were taught, well, if that happens, you should just give up and just go on home. The patient is dead. There's nothing you can do. Pronounce on scene. It was really, it was really bad. And now we have found that, hey, if there's a blockage, just like in the Heimlich maneuver, you don't give up, right? No, you just do better CPR. And so we've been able to find that we can save patients. And that was something that changed 10 years ago, probably longer than that. Um, but thankfully, it did change. And there are people now that have had pulmonary embolisms that have gone into uh, cardiac arrest that have been saved because of really good CPR. So if I can impart any wisdom to you on pulmonary embolisms are that make sure that you know how to do CPR the right way very well, you know, one third depth of the chest the whole nine yards okay <clears throat> so that's just my little extra on the side um this may also occur as a result of damage to the lining of the vessels or it could be from hypo uh, coagulations it could be from some slow blood flow in a lower extremity some of those risk factors are going to be like your immobilized legs after surgery it's not just that it's also um 
hip surgery. If a patient goes in and breaks their hip, that's another one. Smoking, uh, women who smoke that take oral contraceptives or just oral contraceptives. Pregnancy, infection, cancer, sickle cell anemia, prolonged inactivity. That's why they say if you're going, um, if you're on a flight from from Jackson to New York, you Jackson, Mississippi to New York City, New York, then you need to get up and walk around for a little bit. If you're going from New York City to say Ireland, you need to get up and walk several different times because that can cause a blood clot, which can go to your heart. It can go to your lungs. Okay. Um, and being bedridden is another one. Um, so some of the signs and symptoms, severe dyspnea, tachycardia, tachypnea, varying degrees of hypoxia, cyanosis, acute chest pain, hemoptysis, and this is the coughing up of blood. And, um, and I'm not talking about like movie death scene coughing up blood. I'm talking about they're going to cough and there's going to be like a little bit of blood like on their hand. It's not going to be like... Uh, uh, it's not gonna be gushing or anything else. I don't want you guys to think, oh, well, I saw this one time on blah, blah, blah. No, it's some coughing up of blood, but it's not like a geyser, okay? Um, however, we'll get to those later because <laughs> there are some. Um, so let's talk about obstructions of the airway. Um, <clears throat> so we know that the number one in patients that are unconscious is the tongue, right? Right. Um, but patients with dyspnea may have a mechanical obstruction. So what could that be other than the tongue? Well, other ones are going to be vomit and are foreign objects. So, of course, we know with vomit and we have a patient that's unresponsive, but we don't think that there's any trauma associated. It doesn't matter if you're all the way up to a paramedic. The first thing that we can do is put them in the recovery position and allow for uh, gravity to help us clear that airway, right? Um, but that's only in patients that we know have not had any trauma noted to their bodies, right? Um, and then of course, uh, we'll go into suctioning. Remember, adults no longer than 15 seconds in a sweeping motion on the way out. And in children, it's going to be uh, 10 seconds. And on infants, it's five seconds. And then of course, foreign bodies, okay, if they are unresponsive, we can't do a Heimlich maneuver on them. No, we do CPR, right? Okay, so moving right along. Environmental or industrial exposure. Now, guys, I can't say this enough, that smoke is really irritating to our lungs, but the rest of the stuff, my gosh, have you ever heard of someone, uh, what is it, mixing bleach? And somebody put it in the chat. So I, I don't remember which one it is, but it's, you, you mix bleach with something else and you get a toxic fume. And uh, women do it, maybe it's, I don't remember, um, but it's really, really bad. Um, so pesticides. That's one. You can't be around someone who's crop dusting. Um, ammonia. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that so much. Yes. Um, that will take your breath away, literally, because it stops your lungs from being able to uh, to work. Bleach and Fabulosa. Okay, I did not know that. Thank you. Um, I have my own allergy, Fabulosa. I can't stand to smell it anymore because it's all we used at, at the ambulance company I used to work for. And every Sunday I had to smell that for like six hours. Um, <laughs> okay, so pesticides, cleaning solutions, and chemicals, chlorine, especially like real chlorine, okay? I'm not talking about like the chlorine bleach that we get from Clorox or whatever. I'm talking about actual chlorine, okay? Um, carbon monoxide. Uh, remember, carbon monoxide has a greater affinity to our hemoglobin than oxygen by 16 times. That's crazy pants. That's absolute bananas. So we have to worry about the fact that there are potential things out there that we cannot see, and in some cases cannot even smell, that's causing dyspnea for our Patients crop dusting more than one. Stop, Mark. <laughs> I needed that laugh. Thank you. <laughs> um, I see my my advanced guys are up to no good today. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, the amount of damage largely depends on the water solubility of toxic gases. So water, higher water soluble gases cause a swelling and irritation, whereas less water soluble gases may cause pulmonary edema. And that can be all the way up to 24 hours later. So um, there are patients that um, 
especially when they're dealing with uh, crops and such things as that and the pesticides that go along with that, um, that they may get that on their clothing or uh, they may inhale a great amount of it. And then 24 hours later, they're having an issue. So once again, we go back to that sample history, guys. We really got to worry about stuff. What did I do? I clicked the wrong thing. Okay, I'm back. Cystic fibrosis, this is a genetic disorder that affects the lungs and digestive systems, and it is caused by a defect or a defective gene that makes it difficult for a chloride to move through the cells. And this causes unusually high sodium loss, abnormally thick mucus secretions, and these secretions in the lungs cause so many breathing problems, so many infections. You're going to see a high amount of pneumonia in these children. Um, and it leads to lung disease over time. So the symptoms range from sinus congestion all the way to wheezing, asthma-like complaints. So you're going to look out for respiratory insufficiency, signs of respiratory infection, intestinal blockages. And by the way, um, because... This often causes death in childhood because of the chronic pneumonia is secondary to thick pathologic mucus in the airway. So when you see a child with CF, um, the parents are going to know every level. The parents are going to know everything that they're, go that they're going through. They're very protective of these children. And so when you go to a child who has CF, I promise you the parents are going to know more than you will. Unless you have a child with cystic fibrosis. Um, just listen to those parents. Um, and some of them may be a little overprotective, and that's okay. We just have to handle those as they come, right? Okay, <clears throat> age related conditions bronchiolitis, that's of our lower respiratory tract due to a viral infection, and that's caused by RSV. Um, and then RSV is uh, creates an infection in the lungs and breathing passageways and it's highly highly contagious okay um it primarily affects infants and children younger than two years of age i'm going to go ahead and tell you that you as an adult can get rsv you as an adult will most likely have a very low grade fever if no it may be not even a fever at all remember fever is 100.4 so you may run like a 99.6 and like oh well, i'm not running fever I don't feel great, got a little bitty cough, but I'm gonna go to work anyway. You could in fact have RSV um, and you can be a carrier for that. So be cognizant if you pick up a child or you've been around children that have RSV that you can be passing that along to other people. Um, signs and symptoms are kind of similar to asthma, even though asthma is really rare in children younger than one year. Your infant with first time wheezing episodes in late fall or winter, likely has the bronchiolitis, whereas RSV um, is common cause of illness in young children, creates that infection, like we said, can cause severe respiratory illness such as bronchiolitis and pneumonia. It's highly contagious and it spreads through that droplet of cough or sneeze, just like the flu. Um, and it can survive on surfaces, including hands and clothing. So it's very important to do what? What's the most important thing that you guys can do? after you're done with a call and i'm gonna wait i want to see what y'all put in the in the um in the chat box decon yes wash hands absolutely guys that's exactly what i'm looking for washing your hands is so extremely important because we don't want to give this to anybody else right um i got you mark i knew what you meant um okay so croup Told you guys we were going to get to it. Here we are. This is inflammation and swelling of the pharynx larynx in the trachea. So this is going to be this upper airway portion right here, right? Um, and this is often secondary to acute viral infection of the upper respiratory tract. Your hallmark signs are the strider and that seal bark cough. Remember the difference between wheezing and strider is just where you hear it, okay? Wheezing is in the lower airways, whereas strider is up here. Um, and if you can imagine someone has... Um, a, a kid has swallowed like a marble or um, a toy car or something like that. There's some air that's moving in and out, but you can, but you know, there's something there, right? That's the same thing, except for now, instead of it being a foreign body obstruction, it's not. It's your, your pharynx, larynx, and trachea that are swelling and the child's having problems breathing. Um, and it can start with a cold 
cough, low grade fever, and this usually develops within two days. And so when you get that seal, seal like bark cough, it is very obvious. It is very like as soon as you hear it, if you've never heard it a day in your life, you're like, I know what that is. That's a seal like bark. That that's what that is. That's a, that that's exactly what it sounds like. Because it 100 percent is. Um, now our peak seasonal outbreaks for these is late fall and early winter. Like as um now it is rarely seen in adults, but it is, and this responds well to humidified oxygen, so that's really good too. Now epiglottitis. Serious inflammation of the epiglottis, uh, usually caused by the bacterial infection that produces severe swelling. So, croup, viral, epiglottitis, bacterial. Okay. Now, this is going to be the flap that lays over the larynx, that epiglottis, right? So, epiglottitis is this this little flap, this little guy right here goes, psh, he gets huge. It's not cool. Um, so, it's predominant in children, but may occur at any age. Like I said, I had a guy. Uh, not long ago, who was in his 30s and had epiglottitis. Um, and there's a development in, of a childhood vaccine um, against the Haemophilus influenza has drastically, dramatically decreased the incidence of this disease. That's awesome. Um, may completely obstruct the airway, though. So patients are going to look really, really sick. They're going to be drooling. There's going to be a sudden onset. They're going to be in a tripod position. They're going to have a sore throat. They're going to have a high fever. There's going to be the strider. Now we have a high-pitched inspiratory sound. So when they breathe in, it's going to be high-pitched, and it's going to sound really bad. They're still going to have the strider. But remember, there's an absence of that bar that seal bark cough right okay um now it may appear in adults and in geriatric patients especially when these when these patients have other issues such as diabetes or they can have a cardiothoracic problem um it, there's a whole bunch of different things that they can have but usually there's a co comorbidity um it is caused by different bacterial and even viral organisms so yes this one can be viral most likely epiglottitis is bacterial, though. I do want y'all to know that. However, this can and is a potentially life-threatening condition, and deterioration can occur very quickly. Um, and so quickly, I do want to back up real quick. Even in paramedics, we um, paramedics usually aren't a whole lot of, we're not a whole lot of scared, a whole lot of nothing. Um, that's a whole lot of double negatives in that sentence, but epiglottitis is one of them that we don't mess with. We're not going to intubate those children um, until the final moment, and we usually try to get them to a hospital as quickly as possible, okay? Pneumonia. Um, this is a ventilation disorder caused by the infection of the lung, um, and it's the eighth leading uh, cause of death in the United States. That's big. That's humongous. It's in the top 10, guys. So um, it's group of specific infections. So it's not just one single disease. Um, who is at most risk? We have very young children and then the elderly. So if you're in my age range, um, you're normally, yeah, you're going to get it, but you're going to be okay for the most part. Um, tack on about another 30 years or so, give or take. Um, you may have some issues. Um, presents as a localized infection in the lungs that may cause atelectasis. Remember what atelectasis is? That's where the alveoli shut, right? Okay. Um, if left untreated, can become systemic, leading to sepsis and then septic shock. And we're going to go over so shock later, um, not in this chapter. Um, signs and symptoms are going to include your acute onset of fever and chills. Uh, you're going to have a productive cough and purulent sputum, pleuritic chest pain. You're going to have excessive mucus causing pulmonary consolidation, too. Pertussis. This is an airborne bacterial infection, super highly contagious, usually affects children younger than six. Um, and th that's going to be just like the flu, passes that droplet infection. Of course, that also means that it's going to stay on surfaces for long periods of time. Now, this one's going to have a whoop sound on inspiration after a coughing attack. So it's almost like they have this cough, 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 whoop when they breathe in. It's a very fast I can't do it, obviously, because I don't have it, but I'm trying. Um, so forgive. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to win an Emmy over here, okay? Um, but you are going to have cold-like symptoms, but the coughing spells can last for more than a minute. And can you imagine if somebody's coughing 
for over a minute, these kids are going to come back and they're going to be like, okay, I can't breathe. And they get exhausted. So be ready for that too. Now, your child or the child may turn red. They may turn purple. Why? They can't get air exchange. They can't get gas exchange because they're too busy coughing. They can't get any air in. So all they're doing is coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing. And that's why you have that whoop sound on the inspiration as well. So you're going to have a lot of parents that are going to call 911 because, I mean, my gosh, if that happened to one of my kids, I'd be calling 911 too. Okay. Um, airway obstruction. All right, guys. If it's a young child, especially they're crawling around, I'm automatically thinking that if you have some shortness of breath on your kid, they've been otherwise perfectly fine. Um, and then suddenly they're drooling and there maybe there's a little strider. All right. What toys was your kid playing with? Because children, especially crawling babies, are going to discover the world through putting things in their mouth. That's what they've been doing their whole lives up to this point, And it hasn't let them down yet. Right. So that's what you're getting. Another one is going to be tonsil inflammation, may also partially occlude the airway. Um, and some children come equipped with larger tonsils than others. Um, that was something that I did not know. I have four children, for those of you who do not know. And my eight-year-old who is running fever right now um, has abnormally large tonsils <laughs> compared to the other three. Um, so not all tonsils are created equally. So when one of them does become a little bit more inflamed than the other, it can become a part partial airway obstruction. Um, dysfunctions of the tracheostomy may also create that upper airway obstruction. Um, and of course, don't forget about anything a lower airway and that's below the vocal cords. So you can have trauma to your trachea, you can have lung disease, mucus accumulation, smooth muscle spasms, and even edema. And that edema can be caused from toxic chemicals, superheated air, and other. Um, so heart failure. This is when the heart muscles injured by heart attack or another illness, uh, and this is going to result in that pulmonary edema. Uh, the heart's just not able to maintain the cardiac output that the body needs. So when the pulmonary edema happens, uh, or then it results in pulmonary edema, so some of our risk factors are your hypertension and history of coronary artery disease and, oh, and or AFib or atrial fibrillation. So some of your signs and symptoms are going to include difficulty breathing, especially upon exertion, sudden attack of respiratory distress, feeling suffocated, cold sweats, and tachycardia. Now, wet lung sounds versus dry lung sounds. Well, wet sounds are associated with pulmonary edema, whereas dry is COPD. Okay, you have to think about it. If it's edema, uh, it's wet, right? COPD, not so much. Um, there is a table in your book, 17-6, that's going to help compare the two. Breath sounds are helpful, but they can also kind of be confusing. So patients with COPD will have a wheeze and have progressively worthy, worsening breathing over time. Most have trouble breathing on exertion and chronic cough with a thick sputum. They do not have jugular vein distension, which is right here, or dependent edema. Uh, they're usually long-term smokers with a thin barrel chest appearance and medications. They could have like that home oxygen, bronchodilators, corticosteroids, uh, slower onset of symptoms in patients with heart failure. They're going to have the elevated blood pressure, pedal edema, which is edema on their feet and their, their ankles and uh, lower legs, history of heart failure. Usually they're not smokers. Um, not saying not all of them aren't, okay, because there's no 100% on anything in medicine, but um, do not assume that all COPD patients have wheezing and all heart failure patients have crackles because then you're doing yourself a huge disjustice and that's not good. So treat the patient and not the breath sounds. So let's go into our patient assessment portion of this. Um, once again, calm and systematic. You know, there's a reason that you have a sheet to go by. We're going to go through that sheet every single time when we're talking about these patients because we do not want to miss anything. So scene size up. What are our standard precautions? What PPE are we going to use? We need to ensure that our environment is safe. How many patients do we have? What's our NOI? Um, primary surface, survey, we're going to check out and see what our life threats are. Are there any major bleeding? Um, is the initiation of resuscitation taking priority here? 
Um, what are our signs of life threatening respiratory distress? You guys can read all of this, but it's the thing that we've talked about already. So severe respiratory distress causing AMS all the way to tripod positioning. Uh, what's our general impression of the patient? Are they stable? Are they not stable? Is their airway open? If so, is it clear? Is it going to stay open? If not, what do I need to do? Uh, determine if the patient is breathing. Remember, we can't determine if the patient is breathing until we've opened the airway and cleared it, right? So once we open the airway, make sure that it's clear, then we can determine if the patient is breathing. Um, provide appropriate oxygen therapy as necessary and identify any life threats to your patient. Those are gonna be any problems with your ABCs, poor general impression, uh, altered mentation, hypoperfusion or shock, uh, uh, chest pain associated with low blood pressure, severe pain anywhere, excessive bleeding. Um, all of those are gonna be bad, right? That's like, oh, okay, this is a not stable patient. So assessing for breath sounds, one of the things that you're gonna do is you're gonna listen over a bare chest. Do not listen. Okay, I don't know how many, how old you guys are, and that's fine. Um, and if I say windbreaker, um, don't, don't, don't be ageist, okay? Um, and if you don't know what a windbreaker is, I don't know. It's, it's okay, Michael. So am I. Um, I'm at level 42. Um, and if you don't know what a windbreaker is, go look up anything that um, MC Hammer did, and there you go, okay? And it's essentially a wind suit, a track suit. Yeah, thank you, Mark. If you will. Um, and so when you you do anything in that, you move at all, it makes this huge sound, okay? Um, you can't get breath sounds over that, even though it's super thin. And I mean, it really is thin. I don't even know why we had those. I, I don't think it did anything. It might help from the rain. I'm really not sure. Um, but I was styling when I was a kid. Um, you can't do that. It's the same thing. You can't, like, even though this is a very thin shirt, it still causes issues. So you want to do it over a bare chest. Now, I am a female. I don't want anybody saying, all right, let's pop the bra off. That's wrong. You're not going to do that. So what are we going to do? We're going to maneuver around our areas and get where we need to go. OK, if you look at where this is, none of none of those breast sounds are to be taken on top or on the breast itself. It'll be on the very top of the breast or directly underneath. So, of course, we're going to cover our, our female patients as necessary, but you're still going to take those in a uh, on the bare chest. So if you need to, you're going to slip the, the bell just inside of the shirt itself, um, making sure that you're not touching anything that you shouldn't be, right? Okay, so um, you want your patient to be sitting up when you do this and you're going to want your patient to breathe normally unless you ask them to take a deeper breath. Hey, if you hear something that sounds really funny, ask them to take a deep breath. It's fine. Um, you're going to assess whether it's normal or abnormal and your abnormal breath sounds. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you is anything past normal. If it's not air in and out and it's normal, then it's abnormal. That's it. Now, we have a lot of, of names for those, such as crackles, ronchi, strider, wheezing, pleural friction, rub, and snoring sounds. But we can also call those adventitious. So that's another word that the EMTs you may not have heard before, adventitious sounds. Um, so we have vascular breath sounds that represent air moving in and out of the alveoli. That's good. Bronchial breath sounds represent air moving through the bronchi. Good. Adventitious breath sounds are decreased, absent, or just plain old abnormal. And so you want to listen for a full respiratory cycle. Why? In and out. Because some diseases, we have expiratory wheezing, some we have inspiratory something or another, and we have to remember that we have to listen throughout an entire in and out inhalation, exhalation to assess, to fully assess whatever may be going on with this patient. Um, <coughs> pardon me. If you feel like, hey, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you've never if you've never listened to a patient that's had absent breath sounds and you're like, oh no, I've got to be wrong. Don't, don't second guess yourself. Um, have your partner listen. Uh, get that back up. Don't tell them what you hear either. Um, because just like our patients, we don't want to be misleading or leading them anywhere. We just 
hey, can you take a listen for me real quick and tell me what you hear? And if they get to the to the uh, lower left lobe and they say, oh, no, I don't hear anything down here. Did you hear something? And you both give each other that look. Yeah, you didn't hear anything. You got some absent breath sounds there. OK, guys, so please do not uh, second guess yourself on those. You can always get a backup. Um, or if you need to, you know, mute the TV or wait until you're at a red light or whatever the case may be to get as quiet as you possibly can. Um, so um, I will say for the um, advanced EMTs, it says table 17-7 in the text provides examples of breath sounds and the diseases that they may be associated with. Um, I'm not sure if my EMTs have the same or not. Um, and if you guys don't, please let me know. That way I can get that to you guys but i'm pretty sure you guys have it too all right history taking uh sample history has got to be obtained with these people okay you need a sample and you you need an opqst but sample is super super important here because we want to know what have they been around what are their medications what is um what are the events leading up to of course we want to know allergies too because that could be a part of it but and i'm going out of order here but if we can't obtain this from our patient, we've got to get it from our bystanders. We've got to get it from from caregivers, family or whatever. OK, um, if you have a patient who's having one one to two word dyspnea, I'm not going to ask them a whole lot of questions for them to explain things. Right. So we're going to limit the number of questions to really pertinent ones. So patients, general state of health, childhood, adult diseases, recent surgeries, hospitalizations and traumatic injuries. OK. When we get these down, we're like, oh, OK, we can continue to move on. Ask about any previous episodes, medication allergies, current medications. We're also going to ask about like the patient's objective description of the problem. Um, and that can tell us kind of is this uh, if this is an episode of something that's a disease that's chronic or is this something that's new? OK, find out if the patient's already done for their breathing problems. Most of the times when they when you come in, they've already taken a breathing treatment or they've already had an inhaler or what have you. And pay close attention to the medications the patient is currently taking because they may not even know what it's called that they have. They just know that they have medications that they're taking. OK. Um, and if med control does permit, you may administer a bronchodilator via nebulizer for my advanced EMTs. Um, for my EMTs, you may help with an MDI or a meter dose inhaler or um, their, their inhaler at home, okay? Um, you need to reassess breathing frequently and be prepared to assist ventilations in severe cases and find out whether the patient has any allergies or histories of medication uh, reactions course we're going to use our opq or st and when did the breathing problem begin so once that that's the onset what makes the breathing difficult gives it difficulty worse or better so that's our provocation and then how does the breathing feel what's the quality there does the discomfort move where's the radiation where's the region how much of a problem is the patient having so that's the severity on a scale from zero to ten ten being the worst right um is the problem continuous is it intermittent what has been done to alleviate the problems prior to us getting there and does the patient have a cough is it productive is it non-productive if it is productive what is the color of the sputum is there any hemoptysis remember hemoptysis is coughing up blood wheezing fever chills um is there an increase in sputum production today um has there been any exposure to smoke or does the patient have a history of smoking has been, there been an exposure to toxic fumes or chemicals so there's a lot of different questions that we can ask here okay chronic respiratory conditions Patients with chronic conditions um, may have long periods in which they are able to live relatively normal, um, and that's great. But then sometimes they get that worse, that worsening experience, and it's really acute because you can have an acute issue with a chronic lung problem. OK, so <clears throat> chronic lower airway obstruction makes it difficult for patients to breathe deeply enough to clear their lungs right obviously um, if a new infection lung occurs in a patient with copd the arterial oxygen level may fall rapidly okay so if that happens we have to pay attention to our respirations remember we talked about how the apneustic center in the brain doesn't get this they're like wait a minute wait a minute i don't understand there's a whole bunch of co um, uh, carbon dioxide levels so, you know forget that we can't figure this out we're just going to go on low o2 levels so now we have lowering o2 levels 
So now we got to pay attention to our respirations at this point. Remember that, okay? Um, patients with asthma may have different triggers, so determine what that trigger may have been. It could be a smell. It could be, um, it, it could be stress. It could be, you know, an, an emotional thing. What's the deal there? Okay, right? We got to figure those things out. Now, our secondary assessment is going to be just a more in-depth assessment of the body systems, and we're going to perform after identifying and treating any life threats, conduct that in-depth assessment when the patient complains of shortness of breath, and we're going to check the patient's respiratory status. Look for signs of increased work of breathing and handle as necessary, okay? Um, and moving on, uh, what is our secondary assessment of the cardiovascular system? Well, this is going to include checking and comparing distal pulses at the radius. Okay, we're going to reassess our um, our skin condition, temperature, being alert for bradycardia, tachycardia. You're going to look for signs and symptoms of trauma or retractions in the chest. Uh, table 17-9 is going to list uh, types of sputum um, and causes. I want you guys to realize that I didn't put the sputum in here earlier, so I apologize about that, but I just saw it. Um, <clears throat> check for signs and symptoms of numbness, tingling, cardiopedal, uh, carp popedal spasms, um, hypocapnia resulting from periods of rapid and deep respirations, um, blood pressure at this point, um, when you're obtaining your systolic and diastolic measurements, please do it by auscultation and not necessarily by a machine. Um, even though a non-invasive blood pressure is done while we're going down the road, um, it is, it, there's something to say about getting a manual blood pressure by auscultation um, that just, hey, I know now it's not the machine, it's me. I I know because I can handle my own. Um, I know where my mistakes lie. I don't know where the machines do, okay? Um, and if you can't auscultate, palpate if necessary, because you really want to get that blood pressure just spot on. Um, and then, of course, our skin temp and condition, um, check for cyanosis. And if there is, aggressively manage that patient. Um, if they have a change in mentation, say they become altered in any way, then go ahead and be uh aggressive once again okay because uh, we don't we know that that's the first sign right because the, the brain only works on two different things my emts can tell you all day long what that is um advanced emts or emts either one tell me what are the two things that the brain has to have to work put it in the chat for me What are the two things that you have to have in order for the brain to work? Two things. Oxygen is one. Good job. What's the second thing? Very good, Sierra. Very good. Oxygen and glucose is the correct answer. Good job, Lindsay. Steven, good job, guys. Good job, good job. Okay, so use monitoring devices as necessary and as needed. Reassess. Remember, when we do anything, we have to reassess. You can't just be like, okay, here are the ABCs. Let's go get in the truck. Okay, I'm just going to reassess the ABCs. What did you do? We got to reassess the patient after we've done something, right? So, um, if we have had to open the airway, we need to reassess the airway. If we have given them um, oxygen, we need to reassess their breathing, rate, depth, and quality. We need to reassess their, uh, to auscultate their breath sounds if we've helped them with a, the meter dose inhaler or if we've given them a nebulizer treatment because we called med control. We need to reassess their pulse. We need to reassess all of those things, okay? And you want to continue to monitor these. Remember, 15 minutes for someone who's stable and five minutes for someone who is not, why five minutes? Because we can rapidly change in a five minute time period. Five minutes is all it takes to lose a patient. Heck, less than that in a lot of different cases. So when, you know, sometimes when you're going down the road and it's just you in the back of that ambulance, guys, sometimes it takes five minutes to go over all the things that you've already done, and then you're right back to square one, reassessing, reassessing, reassessing. But we're trying to figure out, hey, are we doing good or are we doing bad? We have to figure those out. 
And so um, be prepared for those. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and wrap up and hopefully the next wrap up will only be about 30, 45 minutes. OK, guys. All right, so when my camera comes back on, we will start back. All right, guys, let's finish this up. All right, so emergency medical care. We're going to perform our standard intervention. So we're going to oxygenate in anyone that has a saturation um, below 94%. And we're going, to we're going to provide psychological support because that's really important for us to consider with patients with dyspnea because, you know, once again, I said if they're dyspneic at all, they're going to be anxious at first. We're going to speak to them in a calm, professional, and caring demeanor. Um, we're going to decrease the work of breathing. So muscles must work harder during respiratory distress. Us, and a tremendous workload uses large amounts of energy, which requires even more oxygen and ventilation. So at some point, the patient's going to just become really, really tired and unable to continue this work of breathing. So some patients with asthma may compensate for days, hoping that the steroids and bronchodilators were going to resolve the attack. Um, sometimes they'll be supine with their um, with or without legs raised, especially in our overweight patient, and that's going to cause abdominal organs to compress the diaphragm. Okay, so we got to worry about that. Think about abdominal distension with air or blood compounds that that the situation, right? Um, so think about removing our constricting clothing, belts, tight collars from around the patient's neck, things of that nature. Don't make your person walk. My biggest pet peeve in EMS are people that are like, all right, just walk the stretcher. I'm sorry, dude, my leg's on the outside of my leg. I'm not walking anywhere. But there are people that are out there, and y'all know who I'm talking about. Don't, don't be that person, okay? Think if it were you, would you want to walk to the stretcher? If the answer is no, don't make your patient do the same. Move things around and get the stretcher to them, okay? Provide supplemental oxygen and administer that oxygenation in the concentration that is necessary to be effective. Um, remember, our pulse ox is a really useful guide for oxygenation. If, of course, it's accurate, we have to think about our carbon monoxide. It is safe to administer oxygen in concentrations less than 50% to almost anyone. And that's going to include like our um, uh, AB, ABCs, airway breathing. Can you walk the stretcher? Stop it. <laughs> um, yes, that's something I've said before, too, but no. <laughs> um, that was only when I was burnt out. I took a little breather for a little while, and then I went back, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is what it's like to not be burnt out. Um, uh, so if we think about giving someone oxygen through a nasal cannula, that's only 24% oxygenation or 24% um, concentration of oxygen. So if you, you know, that's almost anyone. That's our COPD patients, right? Okay. Oxygen saturation of 100% should be avoided, especially with somebody um, that we think has our um, um, COPD and things of that nature, okay? Um, so administer our bronchodilators. Patients who do not have a bronchospasm usually benefit only slightly from aerosol bronchodilators. Um, our bronchodilators are little value in treating conditions such as a as pneumonia, uh, pulmonary edema, heart disease, and things like that. Okay, so let's talk about respiratory meds. Most common medications used for dyspnea are inhaled beta agonists. And the beta, beta agonists, they work on relaxing our smooth muscles within the bronchial. So what happens is you have these little beta cells that are on, um, on these muscles. And when they're innervated by the beta agonist, um, they're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll just take a little nappy nap and I'm going to relax. And they just like open up the bronchioles and now breathing is better. But because that's happening, your heart rate's going to go up. Your blood pressure is going to go up. <laughs> so it may relax the smooth muscles and the bronchioles, but some other stuff's going to happen, okay? So secondary bronchoconstriction could be reversed with a bronchodilator. Um, and think typical trade names are going to be like your Prevental, Ventolin, um, Metapril, uh, Brethine is another one. Action of most of these medications is to relax those smooth muscles, um, but... Once again, they're gonna, it's gonna be around the bronchi the bronchioles, the larger bronchi, and that's 
that's really important therapy for a bronchoconstriction. There are the fast acting bronchodilators provide, provide almost instant relief and you will literally see someone go from wheezing, pursed lips, uh, tripod position to, oh, I can breathe now within minutes. And so it's very, um, it's really nice to see that, to know that one medication can do so much. Um, bronchodilators do not reduce swelling. They don't kill bacteria. They don't push fluid out of the lungs. And they don't open your closed alveoli from like atelectasis. So um, medication specifically designed for aerosol use, like ipratromium bromide, um, is available in your MDIs, your meter dose inhalers. And you have anticholinergics have also emerged as a central component for the management of COPD. And for you advanced EMTs, go and look at your table 17-10, uh, and that's going to give you some, a list of um, some more medications. So what are some of our common side effects of inhalers remember it says that we 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 make these the the muscles around the bronchioles relax but because it does that it's going to increase our pulse rate it's going to make us nervous we may have some muscle tremors um things of that nature um so be on the lookout for that Aerosol therapy is just a simple method of delivering medications such as your bronchodilators through an aerolyzed nebulizer, um, and that changes that that liquid medication into a fine mist, and that generates an optimal particle size most nebulizers use to have the oxygen flow at least six liters per minute. Um, a nebulizer can be attached to a mouthpiece, a face mask, a tracheostomy collar, or even held in front of the patient's face, depending on how old they are, too. You can even do, like I said, like blow-bys if necessary. Um, and it's also a quick way to, to uh, provide a cooling mist to swollen upper airways of a patient with burns or a child with croup, um, to give aerolyzed treatments of saline, um, or even sterile water. So that's also good to know. Um, possible to give repeated treatments to patients with bronchospasms, but think about your tachycardia is almost always already present in patients with dyspnea. So be sure to consult med control before um, giving an, an additional one. All right, meter dose inhaler. Uh, this is going to be a miniature spray canister used to direct medication through the mouth and into the lungs. It is small and easy for parent, for patients to carry and use, super convenient. Uh, usually the delivery method of choice for bronchodilators and even corticosteroids in the home setting. Uh, so document how often the patient has been taking an extra puff and each MDI on an ambulance should ideally be equipped with a spacer. And this is what this right here here in the picture is that spacer. You have your MDI, which is the orange thing, and then this white clear plastic is going to be your spacer. And what that does is uh, some people don't have the ability to really take a good breath in or out, and so they lose some of that medication. What the spacer does is it collects that medication, alleviating that whole problem of losing all of that excess medication to be lost into the environment. What it does is it keeps it right there, and they just keep breathing in and out until they get all of it, okay? Uh, patients should try to inhale the medication deeply, then hold their breath for a few seconds. Why? Because we want that to get as far into the chest as possible and as deep as possible. And then we want it to sit there for just a few seconds so that it takes a good effect. Uh, contraindications do include patient who is unable to help or coordinate inhalation. Guys, if they are not able to coordinate inhalations with you, then they are already too far gone and we need to do something else, okay? MDI is not prescribed for the patient. Remember, we had the, what is it, 11 rights now or 12 rights. Um, patient has already met the maximum prescribed dosage and, and or that medication may be expired. Um, so now we have our dry powder inhalers. Um, they're relatively convenient, easy to use, rarely used during our emergency care. Those are the ones that are going to be usually used uh, daily anyway. Uh, consider fluid balance. Common practice to give a fluid bolus to younger patients. Um, <coughs> pardon me, goodness, y'all. Um, common practice for that um, in these conditions in an older adult or other patients maybe with cardiac dysfunction, don't give too much fluid because that's going to cause your pulmonary edema. We don't want to do that. Um, always assess for breath sounds before and after giving a fluid bol bolus to make sure that they don't become overhydrated. 
um, because that can cause that pulmonary edema, okay? Um, support or assist ventilations. If your patient gets too tired, you may have to breathe for them and you may have to be really aggressive with your treatment. So some patients may simply require a BVM for a short period. Um, and it's important to be confident in your in your bag valve uh, bag mask ventilation technique. So if you're not really ready for that, you need to go ahead and start getting ready for it. Also remember, we want to worry about gastric distension and then vomiting from over aggressive ventilation. So don't do that either. Okay. Uh, continuous positive airway pressure, our CPAP, uh, used to treat uh, obstructive sleep apnea and treat respiratory failure. So many people with our obstructive sleep apnea do wear these CPAP things at night, and that's wonderful. That's not what we're doing in the ambulance, okay? This one... Um, uh, this one is going to be used for respiratory failure, and it's almost always delivered through a mask that is secured to the face with some type of strap. It's going to go around the forehead, and it's going to go around the, um, the mouth to the back of the head, just like in this picture. Um, the, you're going to increase pressure in the chest, and as you increase the pressure in the chest, you are going to push down and push out any of the fluid that may have accumulated inside of the lung itself. So um, be ready for that. Be vigilant about monitoring the gas supply. And remember, um, if you do too much, a CPAP can literally turn into a simple pneumothorax or a simple pneumothorax into a tension pneumothorax in only a few breaths. So be very vigilant about that. Don't struggle with a patient who's willing to use this mask. Just don't do it. What you need to do is just go ahead and take the mask completely off and then start a bag valve mask at that point. Okay. Um, it's critical to recognize a deteriorating condition and be prepared to move on to that next step as necessary. Okay. Um, Bi-level positive airway pressure. This is going to be our BiPAP. This is one pressure can be delivered during inspiration and a different one can be delivered during exhalation. So that's the difference. This causes a pressure variation in the chest, which allows for more normal blood flow. And it's a little bit more complex, a little bit more expensive. All right, assessment and management of specific conditions. All right, so upper and lower airway diseases, patients present with signs of severe respiratory impairment. Um, you have, they may include one to two word dyspnea, diminished or absent breath sounds, altered mentation, our chief complaint can be cough, nocturnal dyspnea, wheezing may be present, um, check on the history of asthma and allergies, uh, place the patient in, in a position of comfort and ask them um, if he or she has ever been intubated. That's a big one. Look for retractions and use of accessory muscles. Use a peak flow meter to establish the baseline for expiratory uh, airflow and pulse oxy oximeter to document the degree of hypoxia and response to therapy along with it. Um, transport and, um, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I missed one. Monitor the airway, apply your high flow O2, and assistive ventilations as necessary and transport and call Megadrill if necessary. So let's talk about uh, acute pulmonary edema. Uh, of course, we know it can be associated with our cardiac disease, can be because of a direct lung damage. We are going to give them 100% O2 at this point. If necessary, suction. Um, provide assisted ventilations and establish an IV access and monitor flow, flow, flow rates carefully and go ahead and consider a paramedic backup. And this is for my AEMTs right here, okay? Aspiration, guys, anything that's inhaled um, other than gases, that can be vomit, that can be anything, right? So patients who receive tube feedings are at a particular risk for aspiration if they're placed supine immediately after receiving a large feeding. As a matter of fact, that's a do not do on the nursing list of agendas. Um, that was crazy the amount of times I was asked, um, how, you know, how many minutes do you wait until you lay a person down after they get a tube feeding. Um, but aspiration is such a huge deal. So um, it's, and, and it is because it's such a high mortality rate um, along with that. So avoid the gastric distension when ventilating because that's going to cause vomitus in the airway, right? Aggressively monitor the patient's ability to protect his or her, her own airway as you go through this call and aggressively treat any aspiration with suction and airway control if the previous steps fail. 
Uh, COPD, patients often find difficulty breathing when lying down. Um, one question you can ask is how many, how many pillows do you sleep on? Um, assist with a uh, prescribed inhaler if there is one for my EMTs. Um, patients with COPD will often overuse an inhaler, so watch for those side effects. Remember, they're going to have a higher, um, a higher pulse rate. Um, they're going to be jittery um, and maybe some muscle tremors along with it. Transport promptly um, and auto peep. Uh, not everyone should be ventilated the same way. Remember the difficulty with exhaling, okay? Complete exhalation must be allowed before the next breath is delivered because we don't want to just push that excess carbon dioxide back into the system, right? That's not good. And if you don't, that can eventually cause a pneumothorax or even cardiac arrest. So we definitely don't want to do that. So patients um, in auto peep, that's a concern that should be ventilated at a rate of less than four to six breaths per minute. Asthma assessment is obviously critical, uh, often reoccurring pathological condition. Three components are the bronchospasm, the airway edema, and then the increased mucus production. So if possible, ask family members to describe the patient's asthma. Um, Air is trapped. The distal portion of those lungs doesn't allow that airflow from the next inhalation to enter the alveoli. So now we're, we're suffocating on the inside. Assess your vital signs. Your pulse rate is going to be... Um, Note that the pulse rate will be normal or elevated. The blood pressure may be slightly elevated and respirations will definitely be increased. Um, bronchial asthma is characterized by increased reactivity of the trachea and bronchi to a variety of stimuli. And com this is a common childhood Ill illness. You're going to see retractions in the skin above the sternum, between the ribs, um, things that nature. normally where you're going to see retractions, but definitely above the sternum. Uh, cyanosis is really bad. It's a late si late finding. We need to be super aggressive at this point. Um, be alert for coughs. Prepare for suction. Um, if the patient is unresponsive, go ahead and get that airway management under wraps. Um, if the patient has medications, help them with their inhaler if they have it. Um, for my EMTs, for my advanced EMTs, nebulize medications as directed by your local protocol. Um, even patients who use their inhaler may continue to get worse. So remember, we're going to reassess that breathing frequently. Remember, every five minutes in an unstable patient, every 15 for our stable. Um, and be prepared to assist with ventilations as necessary. Use these, um, if you must assist with ventilations, slow, gentle breaths. Um, remember, in the case of asthma, the problem is getting air out of the lungs, not necessarily into it. So resist that temptation to squeeze the bag hard. Remember, we're not going to do that because um, these little bitty lungs, they only have a certain capacity. And if you overinflate that lung to this, then you're going to pop that lung. And what have you just done? You've caused a pneumothorax. That's not OK. So um, we're always going to kind of do the, the assist with ventilations kind of as a last resort with these asthmatic patients. Um, um, and, and of course, include supplemental oxygen um, and administer treatment with the bronchiodilator. This may stabilize them. Hey, you may even have the status asthmaticus. Um, the chest will maximally hyper be hyperinflated. Breath sounds and wheezing may be um, entirely inaudible because the air movement is negligible. And at that point, we're really behind the eight ball. Okay, your patient's normally going to be exhausted at this point in time. Um, so those are the ones that we really need to be very aggressive with our airway management and oxygenation um, and, of course, prompt transport. So anaphylactic reactions, first remove whatever the offending agent is, okay? If it's peanuts, take it away. If it's hay fever, take the hay away. They, you can't take hay fever away, but you know what I mean. Okay, get them away from whatever it is, right? Maintain your airway, supplemental oxygen, assist breathing as necessary, right? Um, these are going to be our priority patients because that airway can close up very quickly. Um, go ahead and get ready to call for a uh, <coughs> backup as necessary. Spontaneous pneumothorax management begins with our ABCs, right? Provide airway and ventilatory support and consider IV initiation for severe symptoms. Hold on just a second, guys. I'm going to have a coughing fit.
sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> provide your airway and ventilatory support and consider your IV initiation um, for severe symptoms. Pleural effusion, uh, remember, we can't we can't remove the fluid that has to happen at the hospital by a doctor, but what we can do is provide support and that's going to be oxygenation. And um, remember, we're going to we're going to uh, take them not necessarily in a position of comfort, but try to get them straight sitting straight up too. OK. P.E. or pulmonary embolism, manage the airway and provide that high flow uh, oxygen, initiate uh, CPR for your pulses and apneic patients and don't stop. Good quality CPR can help dislodge that clot, and you can save a life that way, okay? Manage most severe cases as cardiac arrest of unknown origin. Hyperventilation can be caused by life-threatening illness or panic attacks. Um, give our supplemental oxygen and transport. Interventions for circulatory support and pharmacological interventions are rarely required here. A lot of it, guys, is just talking to someone, okay, um, and trying to get them to calm themselves down. Um, so we're going to give psychological support. Now, there are carbon monoxide toxicity that may produce a falsely high oxygen saturation reading. So be cognizant of that, obviously. Uh, but when in doubt, go ahead and provide the 100% oxygen anyway. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, so let's talk about obstructions of the airway. We have our upper airway obstructions. Partial could be complete. If the patient can talk, if they can breathe, just give them some oxygen and transport. We're not going to try to get that sucker out of there. We're just going to leave it alone. Don't hit any bumps on the way to the hospital. Just drive, okay? <clears throat> um, no condition um, is more immediately life-threatening than a complete airway obstruction. So if we're trying to get a partial obstruction out of the way and we accidentally make it a complete obstruction, well, who's going to have the egg on their face at the end of that one? It's going to be us. And you may, in fact have a dead patient that's really not good right so if it's partial if they can breathe if they can talk hold on let me get the stretcher okay um remove the obstructed body according to B to bls guidelines and administer supplemental oxygen as you go environmental or industrial exposure <clears throat> Remember, they're going to have, usually, they will have their own team um, available for help, okay? Um, once a patient is deconned, gather all the information about the substance, um, give O2 as necessary, ventilate as necessary. If the upper airway is compromised, aggressive airway management may be required, and you may have to go ahead and contact paramedics and get them in route here. Um, <clears throat> bronchiolitis. We're just going to support for the most part, provide supplemental oxygen, and be prepared if necessary to BVM. Um, respiratory or RSV, um, look for signs of dehydration. Start an IV if necessary for my advanced EMTs. Uh, <clears throat> remember, we're not going to be aggressive with these either as far as hydration status. Uh, treat airway and breathing problems as necessary. Croup. Remember, humidified oxygen is our best bet. It's our best friend. When we're talking, um, talking about creep uh, kids. Uh, allow the patient to assume a position of comfort. Um, so if they want to, usually they're going to sit up. Administer nebulized epinephrine um, if de dictated by local protocol. That's going to be for my advanced DMTs, okay? <clears throat> Epiglottitis, keep your patient in the position of comfort again. Do not put anything in the patient's mouth at all and give high flow O2. I want you guys to understand, I said something earlier about how paramedics, um, you know, we're really not scared of, of managing airwaves. We really aren't. But epiglottitis is one of those that if it is even touched, so you have to remember when we're going in and, and, and we are going to intubate, <clears throat> The end of the blade is going to go into what's called the vollecula, and as we uh, we move the the airway up, and we're we're looking, we're going to touch the epiglottis. We're going to the the ET tube will run across the epiglottis, and if a patient has epiglottitis, um, just touching the epiglottis can cause an already inflamed epiglottis to really. Um, become so super inflamed that it literally becomes in a complete airway obstruction. So when we say do not put anything in the patient's mouth, we mean nothing. Okay, you're not going to give them, 
you know, ice chips because they're dehydrated. These people are drooling, okay? These people are getting just enough air in and out to survive in some cases when it's that bad. So I want you to understand where, where I'm coming from as a paramedic. Um, we don't mess with those. We wait until we get them to um, a hospital to where um, they can have people um, with more resources than just one person in the back of an ambulance, if you will, okay? Um, <clears throat> pneumonia. We're going to monitor our ABCs, high flow O2, ventilatory support is necessary, and IV fluids for these people. Um, if a high fever is present, go ahead and cool that patient. Pertussis, um, infants, young children should be treated in a hospital. Watch for the signs of dehydration. Yes, you can go ahead and start that IV for my advanced EMTs. Um, also, go ahead and get suction as necessary. We're going to give them oxygen as necessary, naturally. <clears throat> um, this is a easily, prevent, easily prevented with vaccines. So you have a lot of adults that are getting this, um, the whooping cough uh, vaccine, okay? Um, advanced EMTs and even EMTs, go ahead and check your immunization status and or get a booster, okay? Um, airway ob obstructions in children perform the most appropriate airway clearing technique and provide oxygen and transport. Heart failure, remember high blood pressure and low cardiac output often trigger sudden pulmonary edema. Um, and with that, we're going to have some major issues with, with uh, breathing, right? So we're going to treat our ABCs and we are going to be pretty aggressive with that. Now, tracheostomy dysfunction, we're moving into something different. Uh, children with chronic pulmonary medical conditions may use a home ventilator connected to a tracheostomy tube. This is placed in the neck, and there are multiple complications that can happen, includes, including secretions to mucus plugs to even foreign bodies. They're bleeding, leaking, dislodgement, infections. So we're going to establish a pain airway first, place the patient in a position of comfort, and then suction to clear the obstruction. If you are unable to clear that airway, you will call for a paramedic backup immediately. Once the obstruction is clear, go ahead and oxygenate based on whatever their presentation is, okay? Uh, geriatric patients may have a tracheostomy tube in place because of airway obstruction, laryngeal cancer, they could have severe infection, trauma, some other inability to man manage your secretions. <coughs> can be obstructed by secretions, uh, foreign bodies, airway swelling. The stoma itself, which is the hole, um, can become infected. So establishing airway patency is an immediate goal when we're dealing with these people. Okay, so um, if you've been living under a rock for the past three years, um, let me go ahead and tell you what the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is, okay? An epidemic is when there's new cases of a disease that occurs in the human population, and it substantially exceeds what is expected based on recent experience. So we can have an epidemic of, the, of a flu outbreak in the state of Mississippi, okay? That's fine. That's an epidemic. A pandemic is global. So if you didn't know about the pandemic um, that just happened, which was obviously our COVID-19, where everyone went home except for us, um, <clears throat> you know, that's that's on a global scale. Um, thankfully, there, there are multiple different um, diseases out there that have not created a pandemic, but obviously COVID is one of them. You can have a flu pandemic. There was, um, <clears throat> what's crazy is that the last pandemic that we had was in the 1910s, I believe, and somebody probably will correct me. You probably already know which I'm talking about, but I think 1913 through 1916 was a flu pandemic, um, and it killed thousands and thousands of people, um, no less different than the COVID um, <clears throat> pandemic that just happened. So, um, one of the things that we have to worry about with um, with pandemics and epidemics, either one, uh, people say, oh, well, influenza is a big deal. It really is, whether it's flu A or flu B. Um, and the reason for it is because it can hit a different strain immediately and move on. Even though you have A and C or A and B, I promise you, um, it can cause even more serious disease on the respiratory route later on. So what do we do? We wear our PPE. 
gloves, eye protection, HEPA respirators um, at a minimum. OK, uh, remember, viruses can live on several for several days on surfaces. Remember, frequent hand washing is the most important. Um, every single test I've ever had in my medical career, EMT, paramedic and nursing exam, literally every single one of them had a question about hand washing on them. I'm not kidding. OK, so if you don't know this already, please know hand washing is the best way to help not spread diseases. OK. Um, also, remember our vaccinations and staying up to, up to date with the latest CDC recommendations. Place surgical masks on those patients who we suspect of having a respiratory disease. And we wear a HEPA respirator during aerosol-generated uh, procedures such as suctioning or even CPR, especially with these patients. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. So bye from everybody watching uh, the recording. <laughs>